Let's talk about the clinical theory of everything. We're going to talk about states of matter beyond solid, liquid, and gas that are essential to understand in terms of creating our clinical theory of everything that includes spirit and consciousness. We're going to talk about the phases of health, which are five levels, fundamental levels of health that are different biological terrains that are defined by their biophysics and they tend to be sequential in the progression toward disease or progression toward well-being. We're going to get into photoenergetics, the energy, energy of light, how the energy of light regulates the living process and healing process, and biophotons, bio, biophotonics, the biological activity of photons. And finally, talk a little bit about plasma vessels in the biological context and how that <coughs> relates on broader scales, on the cosmological level, <clears throat> how they're similar. We can understand the universe and ourselves and healing better by seeing the relationship. It's an upgrade to the model of the cosmos and the model of biology and healing. And, and finally, a model of the universe that includes consciousness and spirit. First, states of matter. <clears throat> we were all taught in school about solid, liquid, and gas. We see here a, a standard diagram of, of the three phases of matter. <clears throat> and I know this group has heard about the fourth phase of water, uh, which is, a, I would call, a liquid crystal water, uh, the form of water that's in hexagonal sheets, very similar to the structure of ice, but uh, in a fluid form. And we'll see that that has some very special characteristics that, that make it uh, suitable as a carrier for consciousness and spirit. And then if we extend this diagram to further to the right and to the left with our modern knowledge of, of physics, of matter, we find that there are states beyond gas that would be ionized gas, it's often called an ionized gas, and that's the plasma. And actually within plasma, there are, there are three distinct modes that are still called one phase of matter, but they could equally as well be called three phases of matter in plasma, a dark mode, a glow mode, and a discharge mode. Essentially, uh, think of uh, a light bulb that's turned on, but not enough energy coming through to, that you can see it. And uh, then a light bulb that's on is, is a plasma, like a, a, a fluorescent bulb is <coughs> creating a plasma. A fire is a plasma. A flame is a plasma. And uh, in glow mode, because you see it, there's light discharge. And finally, uh, an electric spark discharge, such as uh, lightning, would be an example of a discharge mode, high energy discharge mode, where there's actual uh, electrical current as well as the, the light energy itself. And <clears throat> if we look at it from that perspective, we can say, oh, there's even higher levels of discharge that can carry bulk matter as well, protons as well, and, and parts of planets. Uh, <clears throat> and those would be called Birkeland currents. But Birkeland currents will also apply in, in the lower energy uh, states, <clears throat> such as in the body, where we're cur carrying electrical current through the meridian system. Now, uh, so to the right we see plasma, higher energy. It's, the, the conventional thinking is all about the temperature, right? It's low energy, low temperature to the left, and a high temperature to the right. We begin to get an inkling that the temperature is not the whole, uh, it, it's just a scale that we can measure. It's just a, it's just a dimension that we can lay these things out on. But, but Temperature is just random motion, so it's, it's uh, heat or uh, entropy is, you know, thermal energy is a lack of coherence. So when we get into talking about coherent states, such as in the fourth phase of water or, or in the state uh, condition of a condensate to the left, which is in conventional physics thought of as a low temperature state, it is in essence a low temperature state, but that doesn't mean that it's in a low temperature environment. It just means that it's a coherent state of matter that has low internal uh, heat energy, low randomness, it has high coherence, and uh, that it's not necessarily and likely not thermally coupled with its 
biological environment or other environment that uh, it might be in, whether it's inside a star or a planet or inside the body. So here's an actual picture of a, of a condensate. You can see the regularity of the lattice structure. You can see that it's in, in a, a, uh, a planar uh, lattice work and, and uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the condensates of the transition minerals that we're most interested in as the, uh, in our model as the substrate of the spirit body, of the conscious body, do prefer to take up these planar crystalline structures. And it's analogous to, uh, in, in modern computing technology, we developed the use of planar crystalline structures made of silicon, silicon chips, as the substrate for computers for information processing, because a planar crystal can carry uh, energy flow, information flow in a variety of configurations. It, it gives us the capacity to process information. But where the, super, the, the, the semiconductor is the basis of computing technology today, the superconductor is seen as the future of computing. The condensate in the spirit body is a superconductor, and therefore the spirit is a supercomputer. So uh, <clears throat> next, here's an image that gives us at least a mental illustration of plasma. This is a, a little uh, plasma ball. A Tesla coil would be the high frequency, low voltage energy source for that. Uh, we can see the, <clears throat> imagine the motion of those tendrils of electrical discharge that we can call Birkeland currents after uh, Nobel Prize winning physicist Birkeland. Uh, and uh, because they move like a biological structure and function like a biological structure, the pla that form of energy, that, that form of, of matter, that state of matter was called plasma in reference to the biological plasma that we know in our cells as cytoplasm or in our blood as, as the blood plasma. So here's a look in the biological plasma. Again, inside the cell, that's cytoplasm, and, and, and uh, it's essentially a plasma throughout, except where we form the, those sheets. There can be millions of sheets of, of structured water, which is an easy water or exclusion zone. It pushes out the, the, substrate, the uh, electrolytes, like sodium and chloride. It pushes out uh, debris, like uh, proteins that are broken down, amyloid plaque, or viruses, etc. And here we see the uh, blood plasma, the other, other reference point that we think of in our minds for, for biological plasma, the, the blood plasma. And that it always is seen in these, uh, these paired vessels, the, the artery and the vein, <clears throat> and generally travel with the nerve as well, called a neurovascular bundle. Well, it's very interesting in relation to <coughs> the cosmology of, of plasma physics because plasma in the cosmos, in, in a gaseous state, as opposed to this liquid state in the biology, also tends to prefer and form, uh, be self-organizing into these double uh, uh, helical uh, structures. Did you have a question? Oh, okay, I thought you were fascinating. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, so that's the biological plasma, the double helix, the, the, the artery and vein tend to wrap around each other in a helical structure, similar to the structure of, of the DNA double helix. And uh, we see the same in the cosmos. When those Birkeland currents dis, uh, extend from the sun to the earth, they follow the lines of force of the earth's magnetic field and enter the, primarily enter the Earth uh, proper at the poles. And here we can see an actual image from space of the resulting an or aurora, in this case, uh, I think that's aurora borealis in the North Pole. And uh, they, there's, there's counter rotation, there's, and, and uh, explains uh, weather patterns on the various 
planets where there's counter rotation of the cloud formations at different latitudes, etc. So um, at the top here, we see the, the, the layout of that, that uh, uh, schematized that, that energy flow from the sun. There's uh, the, so the solar wind is a plasma discharge. It's, it's, uh, these are ions in the, in the solar wind, so therefore moving ions means equals current. So it's the solar current that's coming off of the solar anode, uh, and, and then some of that, a portion of that, uh, enters the Earth's field, again through the poles, and then there's uh, <coughs> carries on in, out further from the Earth as the magneto tail of the Earth. And then we see next the current sheets extending out from the sun. So there's, uh, there's cycles of, of movement uh, as the, the sun's field rotates and discharges. And uh, sometimes we get uh, even physical, mater more material substance uh, from the sun if there's an extreme emission of energy. There was one in the 1850s, I think, that, that was enough to uh, be equivalent to, to a modern uh, EMP, electromagnetic pulse type of weapon that melted down many of the, uh, the wires that carried the telegraph wires around the time of the Civil War. So imagine what would happen now with uh, that kind of a discharge. All of our electronic technology would break down. But our next phase of technology that will be based on superconducting and the spirit minerals will not break down in that way. It, it, uh, it has much more protection. It'll, it'll produce a, a, counter, uh, a counter field to that kind of a, of a, a stress field. And that counter field is called a Meissner field. That's what allows trains, modern trains, that work on magnetic levitation, for example, to, to levitate the weight of a train in the, in the Earth's field, because electromagnetism is potentially 38 uh, orders of magnitude more powerful than gravity. The next image shows that as those current sheets come out from the, the anode of the sun, eventually they reach the virtual cathode, which is called the heliopause, and that's the edge of our solar uh, system. And beyond that, we're in, a gal in the galactic field, the galactic uh, uh, wind, <laughs> we want to call it that, the galactic uh, current is a better term. And it's a very different field than inside. So just like inside our cells and outside our cells is a very different field, and there's a membrane, there's a, a double layer at the cell membrane, there's also, there are also what's called double layers at the edges of plas plasmoids. And in the clinical theory, we propose that in both cases, these are locations uh, that attract and, and crystallize these uh, two-dimensional lattice works of the spirit minerals, the minerals of consciousness. They're superconducting and resist changes, energetic changes from, from outside. It helps to explain how there can be that containment, how there can be such a difference between the inside the solar system and outside the solar system. So these were measurements actually taken by the Pioneer spacecraft as they went through that heliopause at the virtual cathode of the sun. What, uh, what isn't explained to my satisfaction in the electric universe model of this is, is how that electricity char keeps charging up the sun to produce that field. Where's the wire to the light bulb? Oh, it's not, it's not wired. So where does it come from? How does it get from, say, the galactic center to the sun? And I believe that's by resonance through superconductivity that uh, I model the, the core of the sun, the core of the earth, as, as containing these superconductive minerals. Uh, physically, it makes sense. They prefer locations where they are uh, shielded and, and create a self-organizing cellular structure. They'd be the same as us, the core of us. Mm -hmm. core, core means heart. So next, we we'll talk about liquid crystal. Liquid crystal is 
living water. It's not only living, conventionally living things, but on the surface of water we have a meniscus, a layer of water that's many, many times, thousands of times stronger than, uh, than bulk water, and that's why insects, for example, can, can walk on that water. And we have that in biological systems. Basically, essentially at any surface that's, that's hydrophilic, that, that is water-loving, that water will organize uh, around the shape of that protein or cell membrane and can form millions of layers out from there. And it's not only a structure, but it has a function. It, it has charge separation by the virtue, virtue of the fact that it's a H3O2 minus repeated structure. And uh, so the pro extra protons are eliminated along with the solutes and debris. And so it's actually a battery, has a battery effect on an energy level. And it uh, then also will tend to draw the spirit minerals into its sheets. And, and especially at the, at the circumference, at the edge of it as well, which would be the cell membrane in the case of the cell. And uh, that would be what we are talking about as condensates or spirit minerals. There's many different types of condensates. Uh, Bose-Einstein condensates were uh, proposed by Bose and Einstein as a low, low energy, low temperature state of, of matter, and then confirmed in the 1990s and uh, given the Nobel Prize for that research in 2001. And a number of other forms are, are mentioned here. Uh, especially important to us will be the last one uh, being called most commonly uh, in, the, in the, the common literature as ormus, uh, possibly you've heard of them as M-state minerals. These are spirit minerals, as I call them. And they are the substrate of consciousness as alchemists work with these materials and turn metallic state into, uh, into the condensate state of matter. They experience a shift in their consciousness that's progressive, and as their own consciousness progresses, they're able to facilitate the change in, in the material substance. So it's a mutual evolution, uh, <clears throat> which sounds strange to the materialistic mind, but in fact reflects the nature of consciousness that it's not all in your head. So what I believe is happening is that we have coherence zones forming in biological systems. Those coherence zones of pi electrons in the sheets of fourth phase water and in the pi electrons in the uh, successive uh, planes of, of the sh sugars in DNA lined up in a, in a helix, in a double helix, that those attract the spirit minerals making making, uh, bringing in 10,000 fold more conductivity because of their superconductivity and, uh, and allowing the functions of consciousness to take place at, at every fractal level, not just our organismic level of consciousness, but a cell is conscious in the sense of, of its epigenetic responses to, the, to its energetic environment. So the clinical theory of everything uh, also includes my five phases of health model, which is based on the bioelectronics of Vinson, which is a system that started as a way of uh, measuring water quality in France, uh, getting close to a, th to a century ago, but not quite. And uh, Vinson was hired by the government to determine the water quality in the different communities. You know, back then it was before uh, chlorination, so there were communities drinking river water that you know, was carrying bacteria, and, and he found when he correlated the measurements of, the, of that kind of water with the, the records of uh, causes of death, that there was an extremely high correlation, over 90%, between uh, people drinking surface waters and uh, in communities having high death rates from bacterial infection. And uh, of course, it's no, no news to us in uh, public health 
from a modern perspective. But uh, he also found, for example, that where they're drinking mineral waters in volcanic areas carrying high mineral content, that there, most of the deaths were from other kinds of diseases, allergic diseases and, and, and heart attacks and were in particular among the findings. And uh, where, the, where the water was uh, uh, acid and oxidized, like dead water, uh, but, but acidic, toxic dead water, that's where people died of fungal conditions, things like tuberculosis included. Uh, and finally, in low energy terrain, where the water was devoid of, of electrons and protons, in other words, alkaline and oxidized, that low energy water produced a low energy state in the body that was conducive to death from viral infections and chronic degenerative diseases, including cancer. So based on, on that, uh, he looked for uh, the healthiest populations he could see and he could find, and uh, he was able to identify uh, some communities, of some universities with uh, young people uh, drinking healthy, healthy balanced water energetically, whose, uh, whose bodies were very healthy as well, and that represents the center point of phase five, where we're in better balance with the energetics of what our body is made out of, which is mostly water, and uh, able to deal with the ongoing stresses of life and endocrine uh, regulation, etc. The uh, illustration here shows the five phases and uh, some of the things that will <coughs> grow in those petri dishes. If you're in a lab and you want to grow a virus versus uh, an algae, you need very different growth conditions. Same with b bacteria and, and fungi, they're, they're completely opposite terrains. And that's why today, you know, up until now, over the last, going on 100 years, but not quite, uh, we've had the antibiotic age where we've used f first fungal toxins with the uh, invention of penicillin. I think uh, penicillium fungus invented it long before that, but the discovery that, that that fungal toxin killed bacteria. Well, yeah, the fungus grows in the opposite train as bacteria, so it, it poisons the, the growth of the bacteria and sets up a condition for fungal growth. Sometimes people get fungal infection after they take antibiotics. You know, t today we have synthetic analogs of those fungal toxins, and uh, even worse case scenario than, than having a, an after infection with the fungus is leaving the body in a low energy viral chronic degenerative disease cancer uh, prone terrain, which happens quite a bit. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, so yeah, if we wanna grow a bacterium, we need a bacterial culture. If we, if we wanna grow a virus, we need attenuated cells. If we wanna grow fungus, we need dead matter. Uh, if we wanna grow algae, we can grow that in a high energy terrain that has lots of extra nutrients, too much for what our body would need for balanced health. But we can also eat that algae and, uh, as a food and it's uh, cleansing, that's a clen cleansing terrain, what we call phase four, high energy terrain. And that will help relieve symptoms of allergy. So allergy symptoms don't just come from the sinus mucosa or even from just the immune function just beneath that mucosa, they come from, from deeper, from the fact that the kidneys aren't, aren't, are, are jammed up, not able to clean the blood. So the blood is toxic, it's, it has high energy in the sense of everything that's ionized carries energy. And, uh, and so if there's more of what we don't need in there than, than would be balanced, then uh, that's uh, excess of the wrong energy. So the kidneys are jammed, the blood's filled up with stuff, and now the immune system's job becomes to say, oh, we can't get it out through the lymph, so we've got to try to burn it up locally, create calardolar rubber tumor, the, you know, the in indications of inflammation, and try to eliminate locally. So we have post-nasal drip, and sinus congestion, mucus formation to encase the toxins to protect as an insulation between the toxin and, and the tissues. And uh, of course, the modern solution is uh, antihistamines, which stop that immune reaction, saying, oh, billions of years of, of evolution must not be right when we have a drug that can change that symptom like that. 
But the problem is now we're seeing increased rates of sinus and brain cancer, for example, in those people who take the antihistamines. There are natural antihistamines that are not suppressive that actually help to uh, regulate the histamine release and, and help with detoxification, neuroprotection, etc. Much better way to go. So here's a diagram, uh, illustration, actual photograph, photomicrograph of viruses at the cell membrane. Now, if you can imagine the cell membrane there, uh, having the cell has its energy field depleted. Otherwise, if there were energy in that cell, the energy from that cell would be radiating out and being absorbed by the water, forming the structured water in layers. It can form millions of layers just in a, in a minute. And viruses have no way to swim upstream against that field. So these viruses are a symptom of the fact that that cell energy is depleted. And therefore, they can attach to the membrane, inject the DNA, take over the cell apparatus, and help recycle it. Uh, then imagine if biology couldn't recycle, the planet would be uh, buried in dead bodies, like piles of plastic in the ocean. Okay, we have phase two, rejuvenation train. When, when, when we're healing in phase two, we're, we're rebuilding that water structure, we're rebuilding the function of, of the cell, we're building, rebuilding the energy level in the water structure so that that, battery, that that water battery can actually directly run the, the mechanism of the cell. It can, it can run the, the chemical reactions that enzymes promote. And the enzymes can promote those reactions from a distance through the water. If the substrates are in the water and the enzymes in the water and the energies in the water, then everything happens as it needs to without having to go into a linear mode of, oh, where's the other substrate? Where's the enzyme? Oh, where's the ATP molecule to give the energy? And now we gotta get all these things in one place at one time. Yeah, the, ener the, the reaction will happen, but that's low energy train. That's like, uh, I can barely move. <laughs> Versus, oh, I'm feeling more functional. I'm feeling younger. I, I can do something. I can clean house. When we go from phase one, chronic degeneration to phase two, we can, have, we can have metastatic cancer disappear in three days with a high fever because the immune system is producing so much energy that it can raise the temperature of the body and all that extra near-infrared radiation is structuring the water and it's pushing the junk out. And there's also bacteria that are producing enzymes while we're producing our enzymes and they're helping break down the toxins, breaking down the tumors too. There, there was actually 100% successful treatment of cancer uh, somewhere back, I think, in the 1600s with inoculation uh, in Europe, inoculation of tumors with uh, specific virulent bacteria. The bacteria would form an infection inside the tumor. The tumor would break down in lice. It would, it would form a, a, a liquidy goo, and half of the people uh, were healed, and the other half died of, of toxemia, so they stopped the research. But there's a clue there. We, we want to move at the proper rate, and we want to especially support the liver and the kidneys, the, the main filters of the blood, to be able to clean the blood. So these people died of what was in the, the toxins that were in the cancer, things like heavy metals that, that enzyme, enzymes can't break down, whether it's bacterial or, or our own immune system. We can't break those down. We have to eliminate them. We can eliminate them and bypass the, the clogged filters through sweating, for example, with uh, near-infrared or far-infrared sauna. Okay, so uh, if we're not going in the right direction, that's when we, in phase two, we, we're leaving food on the table for bacteria, for, for parasites, uh, and, and we see rapid aging as our antioxidant enzyme systems break down. Phase three, as we're moving up toward health, is the phase for regeneration. Now, we've gone from phase one where we've restored the energy function at the mitochondria, at the, at the organelle level, kind of phase two where we're restoring the energy of the cell and the functionality of the enzymes of the cell, including the transmembrane uh, enzymes or proteins that, that act as the channels to communicate and move material in and out of the cell. And at phase three, we're now making from one cell, we're making two cell, we're regenerating the tissue, we're going from organelle to, or to cell to tissue level of, of, of healing. If, if we're not able to do that, if we're not able to clean the space around the cell and make 
enough energy in the cell to make two healthy cells out of one, to separate the battery into two and still have the juice that we need uh, and to clear the dead matter out of the way to make room for that cell, then that's when we're leaving dead matter on the table for the fungi and they will come in. In fact, they're already here, the Mucora samosa and, and Aspergillus species that give us the actual uh, genetic design uh, patterning for our blood vessels and our, our nerve cells. The next phase is four, phase four, cleansing, where again, there's too much energy, but too, it's a quality factor. We want to have the right amount of energy. You know, too much energy in your house could be your house is on fire. That's too much energy. Or too much energy in your house could be nobody's taking the trash out. <laughs> you know, that's energy too. So we need to remove the energies that don't belong, clean, clear, uh, exclude all the, the bad stuff, keep the good energy that's in a high, the, the highest form of energy that's usable would be this coherent quantum energy, light energy, that's stored as charge separation in our structured water. Because it can operate at any frequency, just dependent on resonance. Phase five is where we're dealing with uh, so phase four, we've cleaned out the organ. You know, you might go through a liver cleanse or a kidney cleanse or a colon cleanse, right? Uh, when I had seizures, when I had a period of a uh, series of grand mal seizures, I had to complete the process of, of cleaning out my central nervous system. It happened while I was in that process because I was taking heavy metals that were in storage and ionizing them and bringing them out into the circulation in order to detoxify, in order to bring back my ability to read and write and speak here today. So uh, we've talked about states of matter where hopefully now you have a little sense of beyond the solid, liquid, and gas. Within, between the liquid and solid, we've got that special case of water that's got a liquid crystalline state that's not even H2O, but has very particular characteristics that qualify it to attract spirit minerals uh, because of its coherence zones and that they both have that characteristic of of coherence zones, they, that's a shared, that's like taking the two ends of the Ouroboros serpent and putting them together into, into one, that the, the head and the tail meet at, at consciousness and coherence and spirit. And we've talked about the phases of health. So let's talk about photoenergetics, light energy in physiology. You know, if we really think about it, uh, ultimately everything is light. Physicist David Bohm says matter is frozen light. Uh, and he was, uh, Einstein considered him his successor as uh, the thinker to uh, figure out how the world really works. So we have, uh, we have matter, but matter is frozen light and pieces of matter are held together by other pieces of frozen light, like electrons. So the electron, the, our, the model we adopt of the electron is the, a photon wrapped on itself in a half wavelength loop is an electron. An electron un, unleashed is a photon. So, uh, so that's electricity, there's light, which is obviously a photon in itself. Uh, then dark energy or consciousness is when those photons are now contained in a coherent zone. That's the substrate of which is, uh, is the spirit minerals, the dark matter that uh, is the, the essence of consciousness itself. So, Photochemistry, the, if we look at every single chemical reaction, we're talking about reactions, what is a chemical reaction? We've got something with some protons in it over here, even if it's just one proton. We could have a hydrogenation reaction, we've got hydrogen ion, it's, a, it's just a proton, okay? Or it could have be a, some other community of protons different minerals combined, a organic chemical, it could be a huge, you know, 30,000 molecular weight protein, and we're adding another amino acid onto it. But in any case, there's some protons, some protons over here, 
and we're going to combine them together. Or there's all these protons and we're going to split them apart like a hydrolysis reaction. So these are the common types of chemical reactions. In either case, we're either adding or break, we're, we're, we're forming or breaking a bond. What is a bond? A bond is an electron whose orbital is shared by a couple of communities of protons, two different minerals, typically. It could be you know, a, a distributed bond, like a, a conjugated double bond, where the, it's shared by a m multiple minerals. But at least two minerals, at least two communities of protons are, are sharing the field of this electron. And that's a bond. That's a, that's a, a covalent bond. And so versus an ionic bond where it's a, a charge, a, a positive charge and a negative charge like sodium chloride, and there's an attraction of, of uh, opposite charges. So, so when we break that bond, we're releasing the energy that was in that bond, or when we form the bond, we're putting light energy in to make that bond. And there's, depending on whether it's an exothermic or endothermic reaction, there's more or less energy at the beginning or end. Even if there's the same amount of energy at the beginning and end, there's a complex of in the middle where the reaction can take place where it's kind of could go either way, right? And, and, and that's the, the difference in energy level between the beginning and that, that formation complex to, for the reaction to go forward. That's, that difference is the quantum uh, energy that's needed to, to, to make that, that chemical reaction complex. And what the function of an enzyme is to reduce that energy level. That's why we have enzymes. They're amplifiers. They amplify that reaction because they reduce the amount of quantum of energy that's needed for that reaction to go forward. The difference in energy between the pre and the post reaction state is the Gibbs free energy plus or minus uh, whether it's you know, giving heat or taking energy to, to run the, that reaction, uh, the Gibbs free energy is the difference between the energy states before and after. And again, that's defined as a quantum of energy. It has a frequency. It's a light energy particle. So all of our chemistry is run by photoenergetics, without exception. And of course, light... Uh, is the dominant direct, direct or indirect source. It's the energy that, that runs biology. When we eat food, it's the, the energy in those bonds that's being released has come from sunlight, and plants are taking carbon dioxide and water and storing it in, in those carbon-carbon bonds of, of carbohydrates and proteins, fats. So ultimately, we're eating light. There's a correspondence between the retina of the eye where we absorb light directly, most efficiently. We absorb it through our skin as well. And, and recent studies show that the, the heat that we feel when sunlight hits our skin is not just from the heat, not just from what we think of as heat, of the infrared rays. It's also from the visible light that we experience. The skin senses visible light as warmth, and we like it. <laughs> There's a reason for that. Reason why there isn't margarine in the forest for uh, native people and critters to eat either. <laughs> Never existed before. So that light is non-toxic when it's absorbed by non-toxic body tissues. But now we avoid the light. Oh, don't let me in the sun because I'm toxic. So, uh, so the relationship between the retina and the small intestine, the small intestine meridian relates energetically to the retina, uh, and the small intestine is where we absorb sunlight in the form of food and carbon-carbon bonds. Retina, where we absorb light directly. We can uh, and do live on both of those sources of light. Ultimately, it's the light that runs the chemical reactions. We know now there's... Uh, there are species that are documented to be able to, to uh, live on uh, energy alone. In the case of a bacterial species, they showed that in one case that electrical fields was an adequate source of nutrition for that, uh, those cells to thrive. In the case of humans, there are a couple of, of uh, cases of breatharianism that have now been medically documented you know, in clinic, controlled setting, no food, no water for a period of time, and, and uh, 
maintain, maintaining their health, healthy physiology. Uh, how do our cells and our tissues and our different parts of our body communicate with light, with photons? Because you know, there's, there's, there's aspects of function of the nervous system, you know, from the conventional point of view, it's, it's the nerves that carry the information. Oh, but it's, the, it's also, of course, the, the, uh, the uh, hormones that, that are biocommunication molecules. And so we have these two communication pathways, but we have multiple communication pathways. And light is one of those ways that we communicate. Uh, Fritz Popp's work with, with biophotons found that these are, are photons emitted by our living cells, emitted by the mitochondria uh, and the DNA that are coherent photons. They're laser-like photons. You know, how is it that a laser, we can send a laser beam to the moon and back and measure the distance to the moon extreme, with extreme accuracy. It's not dissipated over that space. That signal can be picked out of the tremendous background of noise of, of uh, the environment. And the same is true biologically. A cell giving off a coherent photon of information and energy, that, that communication, that energy can be received and responded to by a cell that might be removed a thousand fold, a thousand layers of cells from that one cell. So we have, and, and, and we have a, uh, a light uh, communication system built in to, to, uh, to even support and enhance that. That's the microtubule system, the cytoskeleton, which is actually where the, most of the mitochondria live. You look in a nerve cell, maybe 90% of the mitochondria will be right on one of those microtubules, and that's the perfect uh, location for its coherent light signals to travel along those microtubules, be totally internally reflected. So, so there's a way for the mitochondria, which is structured, built like a laser with the segmented, partially segmented uh, compartments, so you can build up enough resonance, energetic resonance with the layers of, of the biologically active water to, when it releases that photon, now it's carried by the fiber optic network in the cell, which is connected directly to the fiber optic network that connects between cells. So our connective tissue matrix inside and outside the cell is a fiber optic network that carries biophoton communication. And, and we know from, from Pop's work that, that that system is most active in periods of development where, where our cells are responding to change, change in the environment, change in their own function, uh, and also when there's periods of degeneration where again there's change internally and environmentally. And uh, <clears throat> the biggest release is at the moment of cell death. It's a huge release of, in other words, this is the, the light of consciousness of that cellular level of, of organ, organization of that mitochondria that's releasing its spirit and its energy is, is not being wasted. It's going to communicate its, its uh, death to, to its fellow citizens on the mitochondrial level and cellular level. And uh, so nothing is wasted. So at the cell level, we have eyes that receive biocommunication just as we do at an organism level. What are the eyes at the different levels? We've got our eyes, which are the most specialized acupuncture point on the body. An acupuncture point is by by the material substance definition, it's where there's a neurovascular bundle that penetrates the superficial fascia underneath the skin and feeds that surface area. So in the case of the eye, we've got the largest neurovascular bundle that does that and, it, and, and an organ that's specifically designed to receive light and trans, uh, transduce that into an electrical signal. And then those two optic nerves send two thirds of the nerve current that enters the brain. So at, a, at the body level, we've got acupuncture points throughout the body, uh, over 800 that have been clinically uh, uh, correlated with specific uh, fractal holographic representation to the body, just like the 
homunculus on the, on the ear with, with the regular acupuncture and the methods from France. Uh, the homunculus in the cortex, whether it's sensory or motor cortex, the, the, the iridology map of the body, the sclerology map, the, the uh, hands and feet have their reflexology zones, etc. And we know, of course, every cell has a map from the DNA to the structure and function of every part of the body. So, so we have eyes at all these levels. At the cell membrane, we have rafts of ceramides and cholesterol that, that make the little portals where, where the, the uh, fiber optic network connects and where nutrients are received and regulated or, or held out when there's toxicity and the cell needs to go into a catabolic state and break down. But we see it at the macrocosmic level as well. We look at the, the shape of the galaxy, it's a vortex, eye in the center. And they think, they call it a black hole. So it's, oh, it's, it must be dark, uh, it's uh, dark in there, yes. I say it's, what if it's dark matter? What if it's the dark matter that's a coherence zone and therefore, you know, if it's a coherence zone, that means it functions as a single quantum and therefore it has a single center of gravity. So the center of gravity acts as a black hole of conventional physics, which you know they've never made a black hole in a, in, in a laboratory, never been to one, so it's a, th it's a theory. But this theory explains black hole without the matter having to be condensed, because it's a con it, the matter is condensed in the sense of a condensate. It's a condensate, it's a low temperature zone, but it it's, doesn't mean that, that there isn't high temperature matter within that same space because condensates are have non-material, have quantum-like function. They move in and out of material substance uh, with, with ease. And so they can interpenetrate with other, other objects. <clears throat> so we look at things like a hurricane. Well, a hurricane is, is an electrical discharge at the surface of the Earth and so it produces this same kind of uh, rotational vortex, and we call it an eye in the center. So when we have a vortex in water, we know that it produces charge separation, so there's actually an electrical current produced by that spinning movement of the water. So we can start thinking of our eyes as being this receptor, this vortex that receives uh, the, the most pure form of energy, light energy, directly from our environment. Yes, we do receive it in our skin. Uh, near infrared can penetrate up to nine inches into soft tissues with, with a concentrated source like we use clinically, developed for NASA, called the WARP-10. Um, and is being used transcranially uh, and intranasally for reversing symptoms of neurodegeneration. So we've uh, covered a few areas. Let's talk about photovoltaic vessels. These are the meridians of Chinese acupuncture. There are, there are a number of different uh, ways now of measuring the presence, documenting the presence of acupuncture points and meridians. Uh, and one of the, the first that, that I, uh, first couple that I learned of that just make a lot of sense out of it is, like I mentioned, there's a neurovascular bundle that penetrates the superficial fascia, so it's an area where there's a higher conductivity, or as we talk of it in, in biological systems, it's, it's lower impedance. There's, easier flow of energy. It's, a, it's an eye, it's an electric eye. It's a vortex, an opening, where that neurovascular bundle allows the flow of electromagnetic energy into the deeper tissues of the body. And therefore, it also represents a connection to the deeper part of the body. And because the body has unique connections in every possible way, you know, again, the, think of the, the, the sensory or motor cortex. Here's the spot that corresponds to this finger over here. Here's the next finger. So these points also similarly correspond to 
uh, the, <coughs> the internal organs. You know, if you think of it, actually, the, the brain is a specialized form of skin anyway. It, it forms from the skin tissue layer into the neural tube and, and the uh, central nervous system. <coughs> Okay, so uh, they've been able to measure the actual shape of the acupuncture point itself. It'll tend to be a, a shape like a plasmoid, a spheroidal shape. But when you put an acupuncture needle into the point, it forms into the shape of a Birkeland current because there's now energy, m more energy moving through that, through that vessel, through the, the wire of the needle. Uh, it's going to form a he helical shape and be longer, elongated. We can see here some lovely images of, of uh, the cosmological equivalent of, of our meridian energy flow. And here's a picture of Birkeland current coming down and forming the uh, aurora borealis at, at the poles. And then where we have lightning, we now know that there's other configurations of, of discharge, electrical discharge at the higher levels of the atmosphere. as uh, as illustrated here with sprites and elves. There really are sprites and elves. So this is Dr. Glenn Swartout, and I've been <clears throat> introducing you to the clinical theory of everything uh, with special, uh, special emphasis on light and vision. And uh, hope you'll tune in again. Awesome.